get real advice from renowned experts and entrepreneurs on today's business leaders. Here's your host, Gabe Arnold. All right, on today's show, we have Tina Forsyth, and we are going to be talking about entrepreneurship and also something that I am very passionate about. We're going to talk about leading yourself, and we're going to learn a lot about Tina's journey. So thank you so much for being on the show, Tina. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. You put a lot of uh, very interesting and applicable things in the notes you sent over, so I'm excited to, to get into those. Um, but before we do that, I'm curious, when did you first realize that you were an entrepreneur? I was actually about 10 years into my business before I realized I was an entrepreneur. I had, I always look at, especially the early days of being in business, it was sort of a following a trail of breadcrumbs scenario for me. I never set out to be an entrepreneur when I, my parents own their own business growing up. So I think it was in me, right? Like my parents always owned businesses, uh, you know, up until the point they retired. So it was in me, but I was about 10 years into, uh, as I like to say, working for myself. That's what I would always call them. I would say self-employed or I'm working for myself or something like that. And I had a conversation with uh, actually, the the lady who was the helped me write my first book, her and I were having a conversation one day, and she called me an entrepreneur. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's not, I'm just self-employed or whatever the phrase was. And she's like, wait a minute, like, you just wrote a book. You've created this program. You've done this. Like, she was listing out these things that I had done. And it was like, oh, okay, I think I am that. So, I mean... I guess I was to whatever degree up to that point, but it was about, I started my business in 99. So it was about the 10 year mark before I really owned the fact that I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah, that's interesting. And it probably in some sense is not a wrong perspective because obviously at the 10 year mark, you have a lot of experience, you've broken things, you've fixed them, you've learned. I've been an entrepreneur for 22 years now. It's not like I haven't been going through the motions, so to speak, but, but yeah, it's uh wanting to be something and being something are two different things. So maybe, maybe you weren't wrong at all. Well, and it was to the, the first 10 years of my business journey, I was very much, very much a solopreneur. Like that was my right. business model at that point. And so I would get hired. I did a few different things in that time frame, but I would get hired to work with clients directly. And it was mm -hmm. just me basically doing what I was doing. And it was about, about 2009, uh, into 2010 were that's the stage where I say my business got bigger than me, like, and purposely. So I was making different changes to my business model, shifting into training and coaching, as opposed to being a one-on-one -on -one service provider. And it was it, when, when that, that stage where the business got bigger than me was definitely the stage where it was like, Ooh, okay, this is a whole other ball game now in so many ways. Yeah, there's, and I'm, I know, you know, all about this based on your programs and experience, but man, there's a massive difference when you're doing less than six figures. And there's a massive difference from going from mid six figures to seven figures. It's, I haven't studied this extensively, but the little bit of reading it, I did, it always reminds me of this guy that talked about rules of three and 10. And he's, he's, he talks about how if you, every time you triple, everything breaks, every time you hit 10 X from origin, everything breaks again, and you have to rebuild everything. Um, and there's definitely those, those progressional steps where it's like, man, what worked two years ago is an abysmal failure. Now it just doesn't work at all. And yes. you didn't change anything, but like the organization doesn't support it. Obviously the market can change, but I think it's more an organizational culture shift for me that I've seen like, oh, like that totally doesn't work anymore. Now I have to do something different. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and that, that can be a real rude awakening. I think too, you know, I, I lovingly refer to myself and many of my clients fit this profile as well as being a bit of a recovering control freak, mm -hmm. essentially, because in the, or in those early days, like in those first 10 years, when it was just me, it was, it was all up to me. And like, I knew myself and I know what I'm capable of and I know what I'll get done and I know that I'll show up and all these things. Yeah. 
were very much within my control, so to speak. And then that, that point where the business did become bigger than me, that required hiring team, that required, you know, restructuring. There was many, many things that kicked in at that point. Uh, and, and the part I wasn't prepared for was sort of that, that almost like a rude awakening a little bit of the, and the inner journey of like, oh, wait a minute, whoa, like, this is not all in my control anymore. I mean, that was sort of that shift from like, what does it mean to be in control versus what does it mean to lead? They can feel, I think they can be mistaken to be the same thing in many ways, but in reality, it's actually two very, very different things. And, and there were, there were, I would, even to this point, I mean, I'm about what, 11 years, I guess, 11, 12 years into being in the space of like the business is bigger than me, team mm -hmm. systems, et cetera, various things in place now for the past decade. Uh, and even now I have these moments of like, ee, that creep up, like you're saying, Gabe, like every level brings this whole other piece of like, ooh, that no longer works. Or I can't get away with, you know, certain things anymore that maybe I've been hanging on to. So it is a bit of a journey that way. Yeah, I think for me, this, and like every year I learn something new, I'm like, oh, I should have known that for years, but I don't. Um, <laughs> this year, earlier this year, or maybe a year ago, within the last 12 months, it really hit me. And I was like, I now have to start selling things that my team can do. And ah. selling what I can do is no longer effective or profitable or wise because I'm one person and I, I do a lot, you know, as CEO and I do some business coaching and consulting and like, I do a lot of fun things that I, but I can no longer sell what I can do. I need to sell what my team can do. And like, it's like, holy shit, I have to really, really absorb that and start operating differently because I, I believe up until that point, I was like, oh yeah, we can do that. Cause they can do it just like me. And that's not fair or accurate on any front and it doesn't leverage a team. And so it's just a, it's a really interesting journey to go from solopreneur or super small team of a couple part-time people. It's a different world. It's very challenging and very exciting. But man, the stuff I, I'm trying to solve now is, I never would have dreamed I'd have to solve these things. <laughs> no, well, that's the thing, like in the early days of the business journey too, and, and rightfully so, it's like our early days focus is, all right, what am I selling? Who wants to buy it? Does it work? Do people want to buy it again? Like it's all that proving the business model piece. Right. And so much on the front end of like, let's get money, let's get clients, let get, let's get this engine running. And mm -hmm. I find too that, you know, when, when we get to that point of like, it's almost like, woohoo. I, I mean, I used to think that making six figures was the answer that the skies would part and the angels would sing and I would never worry again. Like that was my goal for many, many years. <laughs> And, and I when I hit that in 2009, and then was that's right when I changed my business model and everything as well, it was, I mean, needless to say, it didn't happen. <laughs> that way. But there were a lot of things too that I just was not prepared for. I mean, even that concept of when I'm a solo, when it's just me doing my thing. And I had a VA for a while too. So I did have a VA for a couple of years. I would send out my newsletter or, or easing, as we would say back in the day. Somebody called me like an old lady recently because I used the phrase easing. <laughs> like I've been around for a while. I remember this. <laughs> um, you know, I had a little bit of help that way, but when it was, when I was shifting into that space of like, okay, now I'm going to start hiring team. Now I'm going to start investing in marketing efforts and, you know, just other, it was all of a sudden like, oh, wait a minute, this money isn't all mine anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it was very so went up to that six figure mark, pretty much everything that came in the business landed mm -hmm. in my pocket, less taxes, yep. whatever, to some degree and some basic, basic expenses. But at that point, it was like, I got to start spending money differently. I got to, you know, I got to think about these things differently. I got to approach all of these things differently. And when you were talking to Gabe about that idea of selling something that the team can can do right? Mm -hmm. Instead of selling only what you can do. Uh, that was another one for me. I had a bit of an identity crisis around this where I had a, a woman on my team. She worked with me for seven years and she came in, she was my business manager, my online business manager. And so she was helping run things and so on. And she was also very uh, involved in our program. So in our coaching and our training mm -hmm. programs and 
because naturally she's very a very strong coach, right? Mm-hmm. She's great at many things and also a very strong coach. And there came a point in the work that her and I were doing together where our cli- like clients in my programs would start going to her with questions instead of coming to me. And it was what, like you were <laughs> the unexpected piece of this, right? It was like, it really hit me. It really hit deep in this way for me around like, if I'm not the one that people are coming to, then what is my role here? Yeah. Like my, I'm like the coach I was working with at the time, um, that was the conversation he and I had. Cause I'm just like, seriously, like, what is my role here? I'm no longer, <laughs> I'm no longer the one doing, I'm like, and clients are starting to turn to her instead of me, which was really a good thing in many yeah. ways. I was like, oh, yay, like, you know, freedom or whatever, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, there really was this moment of like, well, what is my role in all of this? <laughs> if I'm no longer that one, or if I'm no longer the one that has all the answers or some of those kinds of things. And, you know, that that was the starting point where it really was this idea of, not just what does it mean to be an entrepreneur, like that part had kind of kicked in a couple of years before then, but also then like, what does it mean to be a CEO or what does it mean to be a leader of a company? You know, how, and how do I value myself within all of that mm-hmm. when I'm not that one who's like involved in and all of, all of that kind of stuff. I could really feel with that particular instance too. Like I look back on it and I can almost see where, there would have been two different paths that mm-hmm. had kind of gone off. And, and one path would have been, um, oh, let me take that back. I'm got, I would have done something to sabotage it. I would have taken it back. I would have been like, no, I, you know, come to me. I'm the one with the answers, whatever. I would have done something along those lines. Or because I had the support of a coach too, the second path that I did ultimately end up going down was really that, okay, no, wait a minute. Like, this is all really good. And let me redefine what success looks like for me within my own company. It was definitely an identity crisis, though, within the grand scheme of things. I love that you brought this up because it's a big piece of what I want to talk to you about is like leading yourself. But um, I'll get to that in a second here. One of my senior leaders is going through a shift of doing the day to day task level work, which is very important work to moving really just into peer leadership. And, and they were sharing, they're like, they're like, this is a big identity crisis for me. And it was good for me to hear that. And like, I, I don't operate that way with like any identity issues around those things, but maybe it's just because I haven't broken the ceiling of like, that I'll have to solve those things. So, but I, but the more I thought about it and talked to them about, I was like, oh, like, yeah, you're right. Like you can no longer show up to a meeting or be out in person with your friends and say like, oh yeah, this is my role and here's what I do um, from a task level or like what's a visible contribution level, right? Or like deliverables every day. Um, And I never really realized how that could be an identity issue um, at that level. So it was really eye-opening to me. For me, um, I don't know, I don't feel like I have a lot of skills or language around this, or even uh, I don't know if I've had high awareness around it. When you mentioned like leading yourself, that really stood out to me because I've always tried to look what's the next step and what's going to solve this for the team and what do we need to do next? And you also said something else really like, but kind of like following the breadcrumbs. I feel like I could give a lot more credit to luck or following what's in front of me. Than mm-hmm. saying, oh, I had this big strategic master plan because I because I didn't, but it has evolved to where, like, I was smart enough this year to pull myself out of operations, and surprise, surprise, ops is like a hundred times better. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> Yay! Um, yeah, and it's like it's going great, and like I'm trying to figure out, like I try to figure out my next level. The one thing that has guided me well is. I don't know where I read this or somebody said it to me, but they said, as CEO, your job is to remove barriers and provide resources. And that, Mm. that put me in a really good place. I'm sure somebody really smart said that. I just can't remember who it is right now, (laughs) but um, it put me in a good place to be like, Oh, like if that's my job that I can serve and support my organization and I can just do it in, in different ways. And like, and I've slowly, but surely become self-aware enough that I can see when I'm hindering things. And like a recent example is like I 
probably should have fired myself a long time ago, but I fired myself from doing any uh, recruiting, like hiring and an HR director that does that stuff now. And it's going really, really well, of course. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm curious, like uh, around a couple things, I, I'm sure they're probably interrelated. I, I'd love to learn more about the online business manager journey and what you've done there. Cause I think that's a huge need in our world today, because yeah. obviously yeah. with this year, we're all online or like a huge majority of us have moved to online. So things have shifted. Um, and I've stumbled my way through that and, and finally got, you know, in the last few years, got a really strong structure for how we operate. But I'm curious about that and also about what you've learned about leading yourself. You're not just looking outside, it's more internal work. So I'd love to hear more around that stuff. Yeah. Um, the online business manager side of things um that that again was sort of a trail of breadcrumbs <laughs> kind of of journey for myself too where i had so back in 2000 ish give or take i came across the coaching industry at that point and really fell in love with the concept of the coaching industry uh, a very different world 20 years ago than it is now, but still the heart of it is still very much the same. Right. Um, but I start, I went into coach training and, you know, tried, I, I like to say, tried to start my business because I had no clue how to get clients or anything. Like I was just God, the days before social media or any of this yeah. stuff, it was like a whole other world. Um, I had, so while I was struggling to build this coaching business, I had an opportunity come up to work on the back end of a really large coach training and membership organization um, called Coachville. At that point was run by Thomas Leonard, who many consider kind of the founder, father of, you know, at least one of the founders of the, the modern business life coaching industry at large. Uh, he founded the ICF and various other things too. Um, I had an opportunity to work in the company as I started as like doing events and such, and then very quickly kind of became the right hand gal to the general manager of the company. And I went into that opportunity thinking, oh, I'll just, you know, do this a little bit on the side while I work on building my coaching business. Mm -hmm. And it really quickly flipped around because I found that I love working behind the scenes and being a part of a really big vision. You know, Thomas Leonard, unfortunately, passed away in 2003. He's been gone quite a while now, um, but just a prolific creator. Like I even to this day, I have yet to come across some, somebody who could create at the level that he would create. I mean, I would go to bed and wake up the next morning and there would be five new live events on the right. website that we now had to, you know, figure out how to run kind of thing. <laughs> like he was just, wow. you know, he was. Yeah, amazing in so many ways. And, and so I really loved being a part of that team and loved being behind the scenes and making stuff happen and all kinds of things. Um, when Thomas passed away and there were some changes going on in the company, I was leaving at that point and it was like, huh, what do I want to do now? Like the coaching path didn't feel like the fit anymore. And I loved what I'd been doing. I also knew that I wasn't operating as a virtual assistant. So, I mean, that's that's a phrase, of course, that was common then and still today. You know, everybody needs a VA, in my opinion, or probably more than one at different yeah. stages along the way. Um, I knew that wasn't what I was, how I was working with clients. And so I started calling myself an online business manager. And I worked, I spent about seven years or so working with clients as an online business manager. So these were six and seven figure, mostly coaches working online, helping them run the business behind the scenes, you know, get, making sure things are getting done, working with the team, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then at, at a certain point along the way, there were a couple of things that started happening. Um, there were more and more business owners who were popping up and saying, Tina, I need someone who does what you do. You know, I want someone to come in and manage the business with me, work with me at this level in the company. Uh, and there was a handful of other people out there, but not many of us at that point. And they were all full and busy as, as was I. Uh, and then I also had, I started to see more and more people out there that were calling themselves online business managers and truthfully, but they weren't, were, they weren't actually operating at that level. So right. they would call, they would use the title and this can still happen today, right? right? Like they would use the title, they would call themselves an OBM, but they actually weren't operating at that level with clients, you know, they weren't 
managing ops, they weren't managing team, they weren't working on things like systems and planning and, you know, projects and all kinds of stuff. They weren't working at that level. Um, and it annoyed me. <laughs> I always kind of lovingly joke that the whole certified online business manager side of my business um, kind of got birthed because I got a little annoyed <laughs> when I saw that people weren't doing it right, essentially, in the way that I'd been working and in the way that I knew worked. Um, I wrote a book called Becoming an Online Business Manager in 2008. Uh, that, and that's since been released again as a 10th anniversary edition a couple of years ago now. Um, and after that, we started our online business manager certification, our association, and all other kinds of things that continue to exist to this mm -hmm. day. And fundamentally, the role of an OBM, I mean, they're really a success partner in that six and seven figure journey mm -hmm. for online business owners. And in particular, from that perspective of like we were talking about already, I mean, we get into business, we're selling, we're doing our thing, we're delivering, we're, you know, kind of money, we start making money, all this great stuff starts happening. And then one day we wake up and we're like, oh, shit, like, either there's a giant mess behind us <laughs> that nobody gets to see, or people start seeing it, they start yep. seeing the cracks, and they start seeing things fall apart. We get caught up in the middle of everything, the day to day, a really common a really common piece that happens, especially in that six to seven figure space is it's so easy for us to get caught up in the day-to-day -day management. You know, yeah. I, there's so many times I'll talk with business owners and they're just like, I can't get anything done. I'm constantly checking in with team and giving them whatever and working on this and that's going on and oh my gosh, and I'm trying to do it. And they're, and they're just like, I can't get anything done anymore. And it's, that's sort of a symptom of, yeah being too caught up in that day-to-day mm. -day management of everything. Because at a certain point, um, you know, what is that? Like, like you were saying earlier, <laughs> there's that phrase where you're like, I can't remember who said this. I feel the same way too. There's, I've heard people say this, this concept too of like every level of growth requires us to let go of something else, you know? And the very first thing to let go of is usually the doing, like I'm going to quit doing tech or doing customer service or doing admin, like that stuff is kind of the easier thing to let go. But then there's also that managing piece, which for a lot of people, they either don't realize they can get help there yeah. or it's a tough one to let go of because to have someone step in and say, you know, they're going to be the one now that's making sure the right things are getting done at the right time in the right way by the right people um, to get that, you know, to have someone step into that space, to start to really build that space in a way that doesn't involve us being the hub of all of it. Mm -hmm. That's that can be a pretty big shift for for some of us, uh, maybe for many of us, um, yeah. although essential at a certain point, too. Like I can imagine for you, you were saying you got yourself out of operations this year. Mm -hmm. What difference has that made for you in the business? Um, like my goal, the big difference is like my goal is to really serve our clients well. And I, yeah. I noticed if for the two years prior that that was slipping and we were flatlining in my book and flatlining to me is growing less than 10%. <laughs> so yeah. it was starting to flatline a little bit or getting close to that. And when I stepped out of it, I realized a couple of things. One, I realized that I'd maxed out my natural ability as a manager, which I had to develop anyway, because I don't, I or five years ago said, I'm going to become an excellent manager because that's the stage we're at and I need to manage my team well. Yeah, and that yeah. was when we had like 25 people. Um, and so I was able to manage six or eight and then the other people got managed somehow or through some some layers. And But now with 55 people on the team, like I'm way out of my depth in time and skill. And yeah. so stepping back... Um, mentally like the mindset was a little bit tougher but fortunately my coo i brought in is really experienced and in a good way like very controlling of his end of the business and yeah. so not controlling of people but controlling his end of the business and so he was super aggressive with me in the right way and it's like i got it don't worry and like and he didn't let me down yeah. um which is 
I've had that happen. Like I, I ended up letting a general manager go this year because they weren't doing what he's doing now. So yeah, I had, yeah. I had tried to take a step in that direction, but really I had unintentionally hired somebody that was just saying yes to me all the time, which is not effective. Um, yeah. And then it's, but I find I got it right. Fortunately, only second time around, it usually takes me longer than that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and this time it was like, all right, cool. Like the less I stick my fingers in, the better things go. And so I just need to step back. And so what's been nice is like, for the first time, I'm actually like doing strategic planning for objectives I want to get done, working on higher level things and focused, I'm primarily focused on leadership development now. And I believe everything rises and falls on leadership. So I probably should invest time and effort there. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been a really interesting shift and I've been a little bit scared, but I've made the conscious choice to let my team learn without me being involved very, very closely. Like I'm here to support them and catch them if there's going to be a big fall or a big problem, but I rely yeah. on them to tell me if that's the case, instead of me being, you know, the helicopter parent and like not, not letting them fail. And so I made a choice a few months ago because things were solid very quickly after I brought in my COO because I was in March, things were rock solid. And then I also made the choice and I told him and a couple other teams where I said, I said, I'm choosing to invest in your guys' learning. So if we make mistakes, that's okay. You, yeah. I will be here to help you, but you have to solve them because that's how you learn. Um, and that was scary. <laughs> yes. But, but I'm happy that I made the choice and made the gamble because it's worked out well. But it's it's been a lot of it's been a lot of mindset work for sure. <laughs> well, and it is that piece too, like that's some of that letting go part yeah. where it's like you know when we're from a leadership perspective, we're looking at a team member and it's like D -d 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 I can see this. You know, sometimes you're like, oh, I can see what's going to happen. Yeah gonna have you know there might be a problem or i mean because that's the other part too i mean i'm very much by nature i'm very much a problem solver mm -hmm. like it it's actually how i'm creatively driven it's like as someone once said to yep. me like oh you just like to solve really big problems and yep. it's hard to to like shut that down sometimes and be like no wait mm -hmm. a minute this is not my problem to solve <laughs> like let's let's yeah. let them uh, you know and i know from the perspective of um within our certified obm community for example i mean because an obm is very much they they're very much functioning in that space of like pre-coo in the sense too yeah. right a lot of times businesses you know they don't need a full-time employee yet they don't want full-time employees but they do need that operation support they do need yeah. someone that's plugged into and starting to take care of these things through that six and early seven figure space with clients and uh you know having worked with our certified obm community i mean this is a, I've, I've been on both sides of the coin that's part of what i find so fascinating is i i myself you know i, I i'm the ceo of my company i own my own business i run my own business um i'm very much that visionary type that kind mm. of like Oh my gosh, I got an idea. Woohoo. You know, let's do it tomorrow. Like I'm I'm wired that way. Yep. Um, and I come from this world of having been an OBM, although I would be a terrible OBM at this stage. I mean, honestly, like me personally, I would be, <laughs> you know, but also being really plugged into our certified OBM community and getting to hear from their perspective mm -hmm. as well, too, some of the frustrations, some of the like barriers that they feel like they run up into. And a lot of them are based on exactly what you said, Gabe. It's sort of that like helicopter parent or, you know, not letting go of things, not giving someone an opportunity to fix it. Yeah, I had a conversation with one of our OBMs about a month or so ago. And it was a, you know, we hear this, I hear this on a somewhat regular basis too. She was working with a client, brought her in, you know, for specific things. She was doing those specific things. But every time she was working on something, the, the client would take it back and be like, no, I'm going to take it over now. Yeah. It's just no, like, give me some feedback. Like, I get that this isn't, you know, perfect or whatever already. But it's it's a really frustrating, like if we're the leaders and we feel like we always have to jump in or we feel like we always got to fix it or we feel like, you know, it ends up in this cycle of, oh, I can't find anyone to do mm -hmm. what I need them to do. Um, because everybody I bring in, I'm having to jump back in again. It can yeah. start into this cycle. And then on the receiving end 
of whoever is on our team. It's like, they're just feeling like, let go for the love of God. Let me do something here. <laughs> In some cases know, too, I, it's a challenge. Yeah, I didn't, I don't think I fully realized until the last two years, what a big negative impact I have when I step in or when I pull something back that I should trust my team to fin finish out or not. I did pull something back from one of my leaders this fall because I let it sit. I watched for like three months. It was ineffective. The results were ineffective, yeah. to be clear. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to step back in and solve this because I think I'm better equipped to do it temporarily. But I yeah. made, I yeah. set a very hard deadline of by June 1st. And I'm like, I'm going to do my work, set it up and hand it back. But in, in general, I never really noticed how damaging that was until I got feedback from my team about it. And I actually watched a client that I was coaching do the same thing to, to their team and to me, even as a, cause I was a coach and we were doing some service, you know, providing services too. Um, and I never realized how demotivating that was and how damaging it was to a team to just jump in and, um, you know, steal things from somebody that's working on them or not. Um, I don't know. I, I just didn't realize how dysfunctional that was. And then I started more and more over the last couple of years, I've started to view my role as CEO, like being a dad, because I have to let my kid grow up and I have to let him, you know, learn on his own and make mistakes and scrape his knees. And like, I can provide guidance and support so he's safe, but I can't learn or do for him. And, and he's nine now. And it's like, and I raised my five younger brothers. So like, I learned a lot from that. I think I'm relearning some of it, but I just, uh, I've, I didn't realize how, how damaging I was being with my behavior as a leader when I would just pull things away. And like, that really hit me hard. And that's something I've been trying to change and improve on too. Well, and it, and then it just becomes a constant burden on us as mm -hmm. well. Like, cause it, you know, that when, when we're talking about the leadership side of things, it's, I mean, we could have a team of however many people around us. And if, yeah. if I'm still getting involved in every little thing or kind of, you know, poking my nose into things where I probably may not or shouldn't be there anymore. Um, mm. Ultimately too, that just builds this company that's gonna be on my back. Like I, I also like to look at that as like, what am I literally carrying around? Yeah. You know, even energetically, it's like, what am I carrying around? If I'm still, I could have a team of 25 people and if I'm still, boom, 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 that's part of the clients I work, we work with, of course, colleagues and myself, you know, along the way too, in varying places, it's there's this business journey can just be really friggin' heavy. And, and I'm a real believer as well. Like the, the sort of this concept of like great missions require a great deal of support. I mean, many of us, I think myself included, many of us are very, you know, kind of mission vision driven. Like we're doing what we do for a reason. Yes, we want to make money. Yes, we want some freedom. You know, that oh, there's things that kick in, but it's also like, okay, I'm here to make a difference yeah. in a specific way. And if it's just me doing my thing, I'm going to make a certain amount of difference and that can be fine. Um, but when we're feeling called to grow and expand and have a bigger impact in some fashion, it's like we end up stifling and we stifle our own growth. We stifle our own impact and we can end up just getting in the way of that entire mission as well, too, if we're not careful about how we're running things. Yeah, it definitely can catch up with you fast. And I think the the fun part and the challenging part of being an entrepreneur is what's working this year will not work next year if you're growing. And like like we said in the beginning, and so that's a big piece of being aware yeah. of like, I was making an impact. This is how I made a name for myself and helped people and did all the things I wanted to do. And if I continue to do that, I'm going to put my company in the ground. And it's like, what? Like you have to totally shift behavior and, and, and you have to do something that's effective for the level that you're at. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a constant growth cycle for me of trying to figure out what I'm, what I should stop doing and what I need to do differently, what I need to let go of. Um, and I'm, I'm curious related to what you talked about with, with your OBM certification and your whole community there. Yeah, because this is a question or not. So is it is it a fractional service a lot of the times for people that hire an OBM where they say like, hey, I just yeah. need part time and then it grows to full time? Or how does that work? Because now I'm in good shape. Yeah. Um, but I this is something that I work with a lot of clients and I'd love to hear about like 
what does it look like or how does it fit in or how do people engage in this process and like how many people in your community now that they can trust that are certified and like let's dig into there a little bit more yeah an obm is generally going to work with clients on that part-time contract basis to start with so depending on the business it might be a couple hours a day sort of scenario you know maybe a 30 to 40 hours a month kind of arrangement um, and or you know anything that goes up from there and so depending on the business and depending on the obm themselves there are times where as the business is growing and it reaches the point of okay i need a full-time person in this role where either that person remains and becomes you know a full-time employee uh, and or that person may step out in a full-time employee could step in at that point okay. as well too but it really is sort of that idea of like almost bridging the gap in a sense between i'm doing this all on my own and i need full-time employees yeah which okay. which for mo for the most part in the online world uh you know it's it's really at that as you're bumping up to or just into that seven figure space where we you know i mean i believe people need full-time employees at that point in the game if yeah. not before then um but there's also a lot of like i've never had a full-time employee in my company i mean i have a pretty small team we run pretty lean with what we do um but i've never had a full-time employee in my company and I, in some ways i kind of don't want one you know like it, <laughs> it's a good thing if needed and all that um but yeah really having part of what's really key is having someone who's got their attention on your business i know one of the big frustrations that comes up when we are hiring contractor fractional you know various types of support is if the person we're hiring they also have a bunch of clients or they're running and growing their own agency or they've got other things that, that are going on it can feel like you know, I want someone who's dedicated to me. I want someone who's really focused on my business, working with me, working with the business and really plugged into this. Um, an online business manager, they're generally going to be working with two or three clients at the most gotcha. at any given time. They might have some project -y stuff they're doing as well. You mm -hmm. know, that kind of kicks in here and there, but from a, that sort of long-term dedicated perspective, they're working with, I would say on average two, you know, two to three clients at the most. And so they are, they are focused on your business, yeah. right? They are spending time, uh, you know, every day in the business in some form. I, I always like to say a little bit tongue in cheek, it's you don't need to hire an online business manager until you have a business to be managed. So it's generally <laughs> gonna kick in, <laughs> you know, in that sort of that early six figure, usually by the 250, that quarter million dollar speed bump space that can really kick in uh, is generally when people are bringing looking to bring someone in to help in this yeah. way and as you said gabe it might be as simple as 30 40 hours a month it might and then can grow up from there um, but really having that person who's in the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. of the business with us and i define management in a very simple way i mean the role of a manager is to make sure the right things get done in the right way at the right time and by the right people. So it's that mix of like the right things. That's about planning. That's about where are we headed? You know, what's coming up? What's the plan for next year? Q1, Q2, Q3, et cetera. Like they're always looking ahead mm -hmm. and starting to plan ahead so that hopefully the business isn't flying by the seat of its pants. Too yeah. Much. It can also happen, uh, especially in those earlier stages of growth. Um, yep. You know, things, the right things in the right way is really about the processes, the systems, the right time is like that project management piece, like, okay, is stuff getting done? You know, who's the one that's keeping an eye on all of this? Mm -hmm. Like things are getting done. This person's getting that done. That person's getting that done. Oops, this didn't get done. Like, let's circle back. Um, and not just from an ongoing day-to-day -day basis. There is always the lather, rinse, repeat stuff right. that, that a business requires but depending on projects and depending on the type of business there can be launches and you know client projects different things that they're doing and then also being able to work with the team too um because you know there's a fair amount of us that some people love the team people management leader leadership side and others don't mm -hmm. i would probably say most don't actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in some ways like 
not to say we don't like people, but like you were saying, you spent a good five years on like the learning to manage people piece. And it's, it's a thing in and of itself. Like it takes a real amount of time and energy and attention Mm -hmm. to be, you know, I got to find somebody, I got to bring somebody in for this. I got to find somebody ongoing. I need to work with them. Do they have what they need? Are they clear on what they're doing? Do they know what the deadlines are? Is there something going on? Can they come to me with questions? Like there's all kinds of things that kick in Mm -hmm. around that leadership piece as well. So really, you know, it really is in that space of, uh, you know, we had someone put an RFP through with our association. So our association, it's it's onlinebusinessmanager.com is where our association lives and where people can connect with uh, some of our certified OBMs there. We have a directory, we have an RFP, a posting service, both of those are free of charge to access. And, uh, you know, we had somebody put through an RFP just a couple of weeks ago now, I think it was, it, it sort of tapped into what you were saying too, Gabe, where they're like, I just, I'm not growing anymore. Like yeah. I'm so caught up in this day to day of like managing all these pieces. It's to the point where the business is not growing anymore yeah. because I'm too involved in all of this. And so wanting and needing to pull ourselves out of mm-hmm. some of that stuff so that, so that we can keep growing so that we can get back to doing the things we actually like doing their most business owners I know did not start their business so they could manage it necessarily. <laughs> That's <for sure. laughs> even, even I didn't start it for that reason um, in that sense. And it's so, yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful way to work with somebody who really has, you know, we all, we talk a lot in our community too, about this concept of when you're working with a certified OBM, your mm-hmm. success is their success. Yeah. Not just like, oh, I'm building my business over here and I got some clients kind of thing. It's like, you know, they can be building their business and such too, of course, in different ways. But but the, when they're working at that level with the client, it's like the success of their client in that business is ultimately yeah. what their success is as well too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm I'm so glad there's that you shared that there's like, certification for it because we've all hired the wrong people before so it's good to bring in you know well-trained people that are uh you know can help there and then also that you guys can help people find and hire people out of your community which is excellent because it's always been a it's always been a struggle for me um especially early on where I didn't you know didn't know how to hire didn't know how to run didn't know what operations was and like you're learning so many things on the fly and you're right. I never even thought about it till this conversation. Like I didn't start a business to manage it. Like I started a business to make an impact and have freedom of time and money and like all these things, you know, and help, you know, different people that could work in my organization or clients. Like I have all these goals, but managing the business is not one of them. <laughs> yeah. it's, and, like, nah. uh, it's like a necessary piece of it, obviously. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I'm glad it's available. Um, and as I think you've been self-aware enough throughout your entrepreneurial journey to figure out, oh, this is a need. And, you know, you step in and solve it. And then, like you said, you know, you're, you don't, you wouldn't be an OBM now um, from where you're at. But I'm curious with just like a little bit of our time here left is what do you think are the keys for entrepreneurs when they're trying to lead themselves and grow? Like, I'm just curious. I think you've thought thought more about that than I have and done some work. I'd love to hear your input there. I I really think that it's just the willingness to ask that question, which you've mentioned as well too, Gabe, a few times is, you know, where am I getting in the way here? And and to be able to be really real about that too. I I believe that like all leadership starts from self-leadership. So if I'm looking to, I want to be a better leader for my team. I want to be a better leader for my clients. I want to lead my business or in some cases, lead an industry or whatever these things are, um, all leadership starts with self-leadership. And because at the end of the day, it's like our business, this this is sort of a, you know, whether we like it or not kind of thing, like our business is going to grow, shrink or stall based on who we are as leaders at the top of that. And And there's times where that can be a hard pill to swallow when it's like, Oh, it's not growing. Oh, it's oh shit, it's me. You know, like, damn, yeah. <laughs> it's me again in like, some yeah. kind of way. 
Um, you know, and, and of course, we're on both sides of the coin. There's things we can do to step into that. But yeah. I find that, you know, many myself at varying times in the journey and, you know, of course, clients and colleagues I've worked with, too, that that stuck point when we really get stuck in something, it mm -hmm. can often come back to like, there's something within me that needs to shift and change in my self leadership. And, and especially too, if we've tried if, like, oh, I tried this and I tried that and I'm looking for a program and I'm looking for, a, we're looking out there yeah. for everything to try to fix this. And, you know, by all means, there's great value in the things that are out there, but it's like, if we keep looking out there and nothing's working and nothing's changing and nothing's whatever, you know, I mean, I have people I've known for years now that once upon a time when we would see each other face to face, <laughs> events you know, <laughs> we yearly and i would have these conversations you know at lunchtime i'd have these conversations and people would be saying you know oh my gosh yes tina i need to get an OBM. oh my gosh yes i need to get somebody in place oh my god and every year year after year after year it's the same thing and it's like but the only thing that was getting in the way is them yeah. you know the way they're thinking for themselves i've gone through spaces in my business where it's like like you were saying too, what what works right now isn't necessarily going to work in the future. You know, I've gotten to spaces where I'm like, woohoo, cruising along for a while. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, now I got to get my ass in gear again and yeah. start <laughs> doing some things or make some changes or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, and I really do find a lot of it has to do, it's it's being willing to kind of look at that who more so than the what mm -hmm. in some ways. Like it's not as much about what do I need to do? What do I need to do? What do I need to do? But like, okay, who do I need to be here? Like, if I'm showing up, am I showing up in a certain way? That's, you know, like, like we were talking about earlier with team, am I showing up in a certain way that's getting in the way of my team? Yeah, their best work. I mean, we can have conversations and such from that perspective. I just read a really great this one radical candor. Oh, cool. Scott. Um, you know, that among others, there's lots of great ones out there too. But when we're looking to maybe ask our team and look for feedback from team or clients and people around us as to, you know, how do you see me getting in the way here? Mm -hmm. What am I maybe doing that I could, you know, that could be getting in the way of things? What am I maybe not doing yet that could be helping with things here? Asking those kinds of questions and being open to the answers that can feel like a bit of an eek because yeah. we might you know chances are we're going to hear something we don't like hearing yeah. <laughs> to some degree but really it is if we're not constantly working on ourselves as leaders to some fashion then it just does get reflected in our business along the way mm -hmm. yeah I, I think you're right and I, I one of the oddest parts about leadership that i've experienced is when I'm, I'm not always consciously working on things. I, I try to do that, but you know, I don't always do that, but when I'm consciously working on something that I haven't talked to my team about, I can see them shift in that area and I've never oh. talked to them about it. I've never like done anything formal with it, but it's really interesting. Like we were saying earlier, like your organization mirrors who you are. And so if your organization is struggling, then good news, bad news, it's you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, even just in the last few months, there's been some things that I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to shift my behavior and attitude around this. I'm going to make a shift or change. And where I would think it was completely invisible to the team, because it wasn't like, we're changing prices or we're changing customer service policies or like, you know, like things you have to dictate or explain to the team. It was just more internal work. And I saw a shift and change in the team. And it's like, it's crazy how that works in leadership and with energetically how things are. But yeah, you're right. It's I like what you said earlier. It's not what you need to do. It's like who you need to become in order to get to the next level. And that's that's the fun work and the hard work for sure. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tina. This has been a blast. I love I love uh, what you're up to and and the impact you're making on the world. I can tell that who you are is um, is making a big difference. So I appreciate you sharing this with with me and with the audience. Um, and well, um, everybody can check out tinaforsyth.com, which we'll have in the show notes and under the video here as well. And just in our last couple of minutes, Tina, is there um, are there's a particular type of projects or people you're looking to connect with right now or who 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 are you looking for right now? 
Yeah, I mean, any main connections are around uh, continuing to educate and share with people about the benefits of hiring a certified OBM, you know, and, and through a conversation like this too, uh, hopefully this may be those who are in that space of like, oof, I'm carrying it all on my back on my own, you know, hopefully this conversation helps a little bit from that perspective of like, yeah, we really don't care. We don't need to carry the weight of our own business on our own all the time. Definitely. And that's a drag. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Tina. We'll definitely have you back on soon. And I just appreciate you Thanks. spending time with us today. Awesome. Thank you. Bye, everyone. This show is brought to you by Today's Business Leaders. Learn more at our website, todaysbusinessleaders.com. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify today.